lot widely tested on, and we don't give that in the hospital a lot. So, um, but I will let, I will definitely let you guys know. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to freak people out. You guys are already freaked out. So, let's just continue with the review. And, as a result, I'm going to be going through, you know, one topic to the next to the next, rather than just doing, let me see how many we have left. Yep, we were done anyway. Going back to benzodiazepines, um, this is going to be a test question. Uh, let's, let, who, was I with, who was I on here? Okay, so what are your four major benzodiazepines that we talked about in that first class? Um, it is lorapetam, diazepam, midazolam, and tesmepam. Tesmepam, uh huh, good. Oh, also alprazolam. Perfect, That's perfect, very good. So, uh, let me just ask the entire class. So, what do you take alprazolam for? Anxiety and bipolar disorder. That's correct. So, actually, the alprazolam is um, used for GAD, general anxiety disorder. I thought a lot of students actually take that. <laughs> I can see why. Oh yeah, nursing school. I don't know if you heard, but nursing school will kill you if you let it. It's the most stressful thing you'll ever go to in your life, most likely. Okay, so, uh, yes, so that's gonna be Alprazolam, and then, which is called Xanax, right? So, I'm sorry, yes. so the, Medications for use are general anxiety disorder yeah, yeah, and something anxiety. else or just anxiety disorder? That's the biggest use. Okay. Uh, probably, and you can probably give a Xanax pre-procedure, but yeah. what do we usually give pre-procedure? There's two PO drugs, uh, benzos. Yep, lorazepam and diazepam. Good, 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 good. I had Xanax when I got my Oh, did you? Isn't that a great thing? Yeah. So back in the 60s, Valium was the drug of choice, you know, for and a lot of mothers. It's like the soccer moms. Actually, the soccer moms of days, like these days, they take nothing better just to keep going. But back in the day, and this is statistically among women. Women had, you've heard of that, right? Because I used to, as a kid, say, what's that Valium stuff? It sounds terrible. But it would relax them. They, that's the only way they could get through life is on their value. Like, and you'll you'll hear jokes all the time back then. Oh, I need my value. Now it's like nothing's better than see some others are doing too much. I don't know, like, it's true. It's true. Do you remember it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Super moms. Works. Yeah. They do too much. Yeah. It's killing. killing me. Okay, so uh, would y'all agree that Adamant or rather Razpam and Diazepam are the same, pretty much, right? But we're giving more and more out of that. So out of all the side effects, what's the biggest one? Sedation. Sedation. Yeah, so it's dangerous. And as I mentioned already, tolerance and dependence, right? It, it's, and let's see what else. But I want you all to know, to know what's given for what. So midazolam, uh, what do we use midazolam for? I'm going to go to you. Um, it's for conscious sedation. Yes, yes. And what exactly is conscious sedation? Uh, it's an anesthesia used on hospital. It is. For uh, an oh, or Yeah, anything. for anything. For many, like surgery, for yeah. intubation, for putting back that, you know, closed reduction of a dislocated shoulder or something. And that along with fentanyl, yeah, absolutely. So the dazzle is wonderful because what side effect do you get with that? Amnesia. Amnesia, yes, very good. Okay, let's move off to temazepam. We'll, we'll ask back there. What are you giving your patient temazepam for? Insomnia? Yep, exactly. Restoril, get it? Restoril. You won't see that on the CMS, but yep, Restoril. Uh, 15 milligrams, 30 milligram capsule. Yep, very good. And then what's the last one? What did I miss? We did Valium, we did Diazepam, Adivan, Tenazepam, Alprazolam. That's all of them. 
side effect, that's going to be sedation, right? What is your uh, antidote for benzos? No, no. no. Uh, no that was yours. We've already talked talked about fluoxetine, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it is an antidepressant. And what is the big side effect that you have to watch for? Photosensitivity. Photosensitivity, that's right, which is too bad because when you go out in the sun, you feel a lot better. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be taking that at all. So that would be a teaching point. And what is the other teaching point for most all of your uh, antidepressants? It takes two to four weeks. Yeah, it takes a while to um, uh, to kick in. And the other thing too, the photosensitivity is can profoundly affect the eyes, right? So we want them to wear sunglasses. That's always testing. Okay, let's move along. Lithium, we've already talked about lithium. Ooh, the side beds are out right up front here. People go to the bottom. We talked about the, let's see. Uh, what puts them at risk for lithium toxicity? Salt. What is it? Salt, sodium, or salt? Yeah. You, is it high or low that puts them at toxicity? Low, that's right, very good. So we have to make sure that they have a, a diet rich in salt. Okay, let's go to the bottom and do another group of drugs here. Okay. Huh. Let me ask you, on your study list, is there a drug called Fondaparinux? Okay, we're gonna add another med. And I'm going to put it on right up here. Okay, this is Fonda Paranux, or it's called a Trixtra. Okay, have we talked about heparin induced thrombocytopenia? So, what HIT is, is a disorder that happens when you're on heparin drip or even regular subcutaneous heparin. And what do you do when, what happens when you have HIT? What's first of all, what's thrombocytopenia? It's a little platelet count, right? Oh, oh my goodness. So, are you going to stop the heparin drip? Of course you are. You don't want their, because what can happen if they have too low platelets? They can bleed, correct? So now, is there another drug that you can give? Yes, it's called Fondaparinux or a Trixtra. This is your answer to your test, so write it down. Write it down, Fondaparinux. We give this subcutaneously very much like anoxaparin. All right, so what is the drug that you're going to give in the place of heparin when they have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? Fondaparinux, good. Get that right, 100%. Okay, next one. All right. Oh, yes, we did talk about this the other day. I'm so excited. Okay, let's move back up here. Hi. Hi. Is there a drug that will stop bleeding? I know you know it. We hang this drug in the ED all the time because we get a lot of GI bleeds. This is especially useful for bleeding esophageal varices, right? It starts with the O. Does anybody know? Osteotide. Good. For Sandra's down. So the drug that will stop your bleeding or help stop bleeding, like via vasoconstriction, is uh, octreotide. And we hang a drip, and it's very common in the ED. Yes, and again, it's especially good for um, 
bleeding esophageal varices. Okay, that's going to be in your test there. Uh, yeah, yeah, because what would happen? Okay, that's a vasoconstrictor. Yeah. Oh, she's thinking like a nurse. Is she thinking like a nurse? She says, I have to monitor my blood pressure. The blood pressure. Why? Because what does octreotide do? Vasoconstrict. Um, um, yes. Could you say the name of it one more time? Octreotide. Octreotide. And the trade name is Sandoz Down. So it's, Got it's it. absolutely an endocrine drug. It's kind of weird. And since it is a vas vasoconstrictor, you have to monitor blood pressure. Good. See, that's critical thinking right there. I'm going to take out the Pepto Bismol. But what do you guys remember about the Pepto Bismol? <laughs> it's pink. It's like bubble gum. That's definitely out of the other words. It's pink. That's really relevant, isn't it? Oh, that's hilarious. Remember, it binds to diarrhea causing bacteria. But I'm taking that out. I'm putting the big guns in here. If that is not a big gun test on the boards or CMS, it, you will not see it. That one's going away. We've already talked about a bit of toin. And let me just double check and see what I have here. Uh, gingival hyperplasia, we already did. And, and back there she said, well, what's the other, actually more important thing? Bits of Bosica. Bits of Yeah, you can, bless you, you can lose your arm with that one. Okay, we are cranking along here. Uh, the next one is going to be, oh, this is good. This is a, you went ahead and answered, is there a medication, an anti-emetic, that is very good with emptying the stomach? It's, a, it's what we call a prokinetic anti-emetic. That rhymed. Starts with the M. What is it? Yes. Yes, that's Redlin. Very good. Do we love Redlin? Yes, we do. It's an antiemetic. Via, it's a prokinetic. And what that means is it causes the motility to be higher. And so when you when you like empty the stomach, it, it alleviates pressure, you know, stimulation to the medulla oblongata. So they're gonna lose that sensation of throwing up. It is my favorite antiemetic. You know why? Because it does not make them sleepy. But if you take it long term, this is the bad part. Like an at home health care or something, what is the problem with it? Tardive gis. Whoa, somebody's prepared over there. Tardive dyskinesia. And what exactly is tardive dyskinesia? Yeah, it's bad. It's mostly in the face. It's it's not as big as some of these, you know, there's apophysia, there's tardive dyskinesia, there's all kinds of, and Parkinsonianism. Yes, yes, you guys, this is a scary thing. This, I can almost guarantee, is going to be on the board you're seeing this. I'm telling you, it's going to be on my desk, I can tell you right now. But yeah, it's permanent. Lawsuits, they have lawsuits for this. Yeah. Okay, very, very good. Uh, let's move off to, oh, psychosis. I think we've already done this one. Oh, we have. What was one of those antipsychotic drugs we were talking about? Starts with the C. Yeah, but it's different. But yeah, it's the P, lots of P's, right? So what you what I want you to know for your test, recognize clozapine as being what kind of medication? Anti. <coughs> An antipsychotic. And just in general, what do you guys remember about antipsychotic meds? They're the ones that cause all that stuff. The akathisia, and it, it can, you can also get tardive dyskinesia from, from your antipsychotic. 
So they come into the clinic and they're like, oh, they do. They have all different types of, of expressions there. Okay, so clozapine, right? That's going to be on my test. But when you're studying for your CMS or like two or three other meds, just recognize those. Those are antipsychotics. Okay, let's move along. We are trucking now. Okay. Oh. oh, this is a really, really good one. Colony stimulators. This is going to land on you, Donna. Mm -hmm. So what are colony stimulators exactly? Mm -hmm. I found this in the box. Huh? Is that the open patient? Is this that one? She said, is it for cancer patients? It certainly is. is <clears throat> Ooh, it's to treat myelosuppression. Yes. And what exactly is myelosuppression? Suppression of the bone marrow. Suppression of the bone marrow. And if you have bone marrow suppression, what are you going to be low in? Three things. Um, RBCs? What about those? And platelets. Bam. Could you get really... <laughs> Could you get really sick with those? All three. Do you have anemia? Not good. How about infection that can lead to sepsis? And what's the third one? You can bleed out if you have no platelets. So what are your drugs? Let's move along. What are your three drugs? Ooh, a ropopoid or alpha, alpha poetin A, right? Good. What are the other two? Yeah, mutagen, which is filbrastim. Yep, that's definitely on there. And then what's the third one that affects the platelets? Oprah, Oprah Belkin, Oprah Belkin. Those are all three gonna be in select all that apply. All right, what I like about the Oprah part is platelets, right? And then you have the filgrastra, which are new neutrophils, so there's that P platelets. Oh, I love that. Why didn't I notice that before? I may have two semesters ago. Yeah, the P and Oprah for um, uh, platelets. All right. Okay, who is next? Hi. Hi. I'm going to grab something here really, really quick here. I just want to take a look. Well, I'm going to go ahead and add this. Uh, oh, not add it, but uh, it is not in this little stack here. They're missing a few minutes, but. Okay. All right. So, uh, this is big in ATI. The FOSA prepotent and the A prepotent. So, what do you remember about those drugs? What are they? Um, what did you say? Substance P receptors. Substance P blocker, right? That's right. And what exactly is substance P? Yes. Substance P increases the sensation of pain and that nausea. So you survive, like pain, like stop doing what's causing that pain. Substance P makes it more intense. Or uh, if you have swallowed some sort of um, a toxin, the, the substance P makes it stronger like the effects of it, right? Okay. Oh. So yeah, that's what, I, so there's two drugs, there's phosphoprepotent and A-prepotent that ATI really, really likes. All right, we've already done the chemo and radiation stuff with the myelosuppression. Okay. Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Or no, 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 Ambriano. You answered though, didn't you? Yeah. So Elizabeth, 
So I have a question for you about a pa your patient takes tons of antibiotics, right? So what are you going to give them? Probiotic. Yeah, why would you have to give a probiotic? Uh, if you kill off normal flora. Yeah, and if you kill off normal flora or normal bacteria, why is that a problem? Um, yeah, you can see because some of those bacteria keep other bacteria in check, right? They they do, and so you kill off the good bacteria, so everything else just blooms and causes illness, like C. difficile, gross. It's got the worst smell, right? And it can make them very sick, like diarrhea. Too much. I'm looking for something. I'm, I'm just. Talking over papers, yes. I'm trying to, uh, I have eight hours of lecture tomorrow and then four, three today, so I'm trying to save my voice. Keeping it really quiet. Okay, um, so probiotics. And what is the probiotic called? Does anybody know? Yeah, it's called basin. And it is basically the basin is mm -hmm. acidophilus. Okay, very good. Let's move up here. Okay, this everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. So, Marie, <coughs> what is a good antiemetic for chemotherapy patients? Okay. Yes. Yeah. What's the what's your yeah. generic thing? Ondansetron. Okay. So, what is the problem side effect with ondansetron? Mm -hmm. Promo QT interval. So is that, could that be deadly? Because that could turn into what? Torsa. Torsa. That's the point. Very, very good. All right. Okay, I'm not going to add any more. There was some other stuff. Let's see. <clears throat> yep, it's in red. QT pro, uh, prolongation. And how soon do you have to give it before the chemotherapy? 30 minutes. 30 minutes before, yeah. Pretty simple on the on Dancitron. Pretty straightforward. Okay, Sarah. Most antiemetics, like your um, uh, promethazine, your colpazine, all of those, they they have a propensity to cause what? One word, one side effect that's just horrible and dangerous too. Is the word most toxicity extra fixation? Well, that would be your promethazine, but it's a side effect across most antiemetics. Mm -mm. No, that's antibiotic. Drowsiness. Oh, you've seen that before, right? So you have to be really careful. Our discussion that we had was with elderly people. Elderly people, please lower, lower that dose. Lower that dose. Why? And do we have an antidote? We do not have an antidote here at all. So are they going to be worked out for a whole 12 hours? You can't do it. So you have to call and say, I would like, and this is very normal for like um, uh, Finnergan, right? The promethazine is I would like 0 0.625 to 12.5. Because a normal dose would be 25. Are you kidding me? Even for a normal young person, that's way too much. So I would, I would decrease it to 0 0.625 or 12 and a half. It depends. It really depends. But I usually, for elderly, 0 0.65. That's not going to be on your test. But what is going to be on your test for, for antiemetic sedation? It's a safety thing. But what's the big deal with specifically uh, promethazine? That's also a safety Yes, big time. Lawsuit worthy. I don't know if you guys looked at that lawsuit. I don't know. The last time I looked, I think it was 2.1 million. That's a lot of money. But yet, she can't do what she has to do and she loves to do. So that's kind of sad. Okay, who's next? Let's go to, um, uh, oh my gosh, Michaela. Oh, geez. 
What is a drug that they take PO that coats the ulcers and coats the lining of the stomach? Is it Caraphate? Yes, Caraphate. Mucosal protectant right here. Yeah, so sulfate. So definitely know that, that uh, the therapeutic effect is coating the stomach. That's all you need to know. And it really, so it's viscous enough to where it seats itself in those, those lesions, right? Yeah, I've already actually gone through all these meds once, at least. Okay, uh, let's go to the next student over there. What is it? We've got... Oh, oh, this is a good one. Okay. It's an atypical anti-emetic, and it, it came about in popularity about 15 years ago. And... It is normally used to reverse opioid overdose, correct? Mm -hmm. But can it be used for nausea? And what is it? What is your what is your antidote for opioids? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Relax them, right? But what makes it different than being a reversal item or drug and being a uh, uh, antiemetic? Yeah, you give about half a dose, whatever your protocol says. So always know, if you see that, it's not a mistake. It's going to say, naloxone, you know, whatever the dose, it's a smaller dose. Uh, for nausea, PRN for nausea, isn't that amazing? I put that on your test because I don't want you guys to, to freak out out there because it's a real deal. Okay. Oh, let's get into more GI meds. So who is next over there? All right. <clears throat> so, what are two medications that we use a lot in like acute settings and even at home for acid? Besides the antacids like Maalox, Mylanta, those kinds of things. Like proton pump inhibitors. Yep, proton pump inhibitors, and what's the other ones? Um, H2 antagonists or H2 blockers, right? So, uh, so which one are we? Bless you. Which one are we using the most now? Proton pump inhibitors, and why is that? They work very well. Because, do you guys remember that word that I wrote up on the board? It causes this environment in your stomach of what? A? Yeah, good job. A carhydria. And what does A mean? Without hydrochloric acid. So basically, it works much better than your H2 antagonist. So if they have, if, so unfortunately, some people have allergies, not a lot though, to the proton pump inhibitors. Will you go to the H2 antagonist? Yeah, they'll revert back to your, your H2 antagonist. And what do they sound like? What do they sound like? Semetidine, ranitidine, bamotidine, they all sound the same. So there's a problem with those. I'm not going to have this on this test, but they can cause hypotension. So that's why when you give the pepsin IV push, you have to do it very slowly. How slowly? Does anybody know? Two to five minutes. Two to five minutes. At one time, they said five minutes because it can cause tinnitus and hypotension. Now, with the PPIs, those have very little problems. They're, they're actually quite good. So definitely hypotension for the H2 antagonist. 
I don't want to hear anything. We did that because we do still give those, and you, you, it's going to be on your boards probably. Okay. Let's move out to Terry. So, there is a laxative that we give. They can take it at home, or they can take it, we can give it in the hospital. And I would like to know what the chemical name of that drug is. Are you talking about like Ducolax? A Ducolax can be a pill or a suppository. Yeah. But this one is used for that continuum of either being a laxative or being a prep. And it starts with a P. Pericolase? What is it? Pericolase? No. Pericolase is, is a, um, it's sort of a laxative, a stimulant, irritant laxative. Does anybody know? Yes, yes, yes. It's PEG, which is going to be your polyethylene glycol. Yeah, your PEG. So remember with the polyethylene glycol, so what is the, what's the name of it when you give it as a laxative? Miralax. Yeah, Miralax, good. And then what's the prep? Go lightly. Very nice. We don't go lightly. <laughs> But I like the fact that they they put the L Y T in there because you can pee, uh, pee. you can poop out all of your electrolytes, including potassium. It's I can tell you one thing, it's worked so well. Now I put these two drugs together for you. The two P's. What are your two P's that can be a vesicant and lose an arm? Promethazine and good. And uh, yeah, benetol. Mm -hmm. I put those together so you recognize the two P, the two evil P's. Are there other vesicant drugs? Oh, ooh, there's a third one, potassium. Ooh, but I'm not going to put that on here. But remember, potassium is also a vesicant. And then, what are some other vesicant drugs? We don't give this one much anymore. Demerol. Did you guys know that Demerol is a hot drug too? It is terrible. Hot drug. What's the other one? Don't we have another one? And of course, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, if you don't have a porta cap, I've seen, I've seen them come in, like if they had an IV, a peripheral IV in their hand, it, it leaked out, which is called extravasation. This whole hand was a crevice. Everything was burnt out. And what's a word I'm looking for? Just burn. I mean, gone. Just destroyed. Huh? It's like, a, it's like an ulcer, except it's done chemically. So it, it's like a, a crevice. I, I'm looking for the right word to explain it, but it's like burnt out completely. Oh, it's horrible. So that person, had, I'm sure, had to go through wound care for months and months with that. Okay. Oh. So why are we giving, let's go back to the back there. Why are you giving H2 antagonists and PPIs and drugs like that? Um, for a greater gastritis? Yeah, definitely. So it's given for mostly for Oh, and also for stress, for like an MI? Oh, uh, yes, yes, for stressful situation. We would give protonics every day. Actually, IV push, we gave them the big stuff. Because MIs, cabbages, all that cardiac stuff, put a, great, a, a big stress on the body, right? So GERD, uh, hyperacidity, heartburn, heartburn, so it's OTC, heartburn, absolutely. Anything that causes hyperacidity, definitely. How many different ways can you give protonics or pantoprazole? How many different ways can you give it? Mm. Yeah, IV push, yeah. Perecto, you can give it PO. Can you give it an IV? Yeah. Like uh, besides a bolus, you can <clears throat> give it in the 
like piggyback, absolutely. And then of course, with bitterbin promethazine, I think that is the standard of practice now for promethazine. So you don't push it, get the best you can, lose an arm, definitely. But I'm, I'm hearing from students who are in clinical that yeah, we have not seen bitterbin IV push in a long time, which it shouldn't be. I think that started happening about five or six years ago. Standard practice is, is the, the piggyback. Highly diluted. Even you guys with, with the 10 cc dilution and a syringe, it's not enough. It's still considered highly desiccant. So they probably, I think the uh, bag is in a 50 cc. Yeah, I think I heard it's in a 50 cc thing. Okay, here we go. So, we have a patient who um, takes insets, right? So why would they have to take massive doses of insets every day? <gasps> Maybe tolerance, yeah, because the, the elderly folks take more. That's a really, really good point. And we know that they take more than they're supposed to because they come in with no kidneys and they have GI bleed. That's a really good point. But, bless you, what if the dog orders the insects? What do they most typically, will typically have a, yeah, we'll have tissues with me today, uh, allergy to? They'll have an allergy to something. And then that'll cause them to take an alternative uh, anti-inflammatory. What is it? Corticosteroids, right? So they can't take corticosteroids because it's, they're allergic to it or they can't tolerate it in some way. So is there going to be a prescription that they take that uh, along with taking the insects? Cytotec? Yeah, Cytotec, which is what's your chemical name of that? Misoprostol. And it's a prostaglandin. There's a, pro a naturally occurring prostaglandin in your stomach that helps to uh, create or build up that mu protective mucosal layer. That's exactly what it does. It stimulates those cells, those, those mucus cells, to make more mucus so you have a, a thicker mu mucoid, um, mucus protective layer. So they'll, they'll probably, you can, I believe you cannot get this OTC. I'm pretty sure it's only um, uh, prescription. Okay, very good. We've already done the, the bowel prep. Let's see, where are we? Uh, who's, who has I done it? Who have I done Okay, great. So we've already talked about polyethylene glycol or the PEG. Let's see here. Oh. Okay, this is a different prep. So what other preps might we use for like a colonoscopy? Mag citrate. Yep, mag citrate, absolutely. Yes, and uh, I think it is a mucosal protectant, prostaglandins, osmotic laxatives, antihistamines, okay. I don't know if it's in there. Yeah, so that's going to be mad citrate. I saw that the other night. Okay, let's see. Where are you going to find your immunizations to study? Oh, uh, uh, exercises. I think there's one through five, correct? Yes. Very good. All right. Did we talk about uh, radioactive iodine for far? I don't think we did. I think I, I'm going to save that for your endocrine test. Yeah. All right. Who is next? Are you next? This is good. You? Um, I didn't answer. Oh, yeah. So she's good. Tell us about the Coumadin Heparin Bridge or the Heparin Coumadin Bridge, rather. So, with. Coumadin and yes. heparin, you want to give it like at the same time. Yes. Because Coumadin takes longer to kick in. So you want the heparin to start off 
bridging the patient because it's more of an emergency that they need it until it's committed to the family. Yes, yeah. So they're on an heparin drip or probably a DVT or pulmonary embolism or something like that, right? So they have to go home. So this is the premise of the whole thing. They can't go home on heparin drip. They usually <clears throat> don't, right? So you have to then give them what they will be taking at home, which is Coumadin or Warfarin. And so the, 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 um, you're bridging both the starting the Coumadin, still on heparin, until what happens? And there's some very key words that you want to associate with this. Therapeutic. I can see her mouth, therapeutic. And what's a therapeutic IMR? Two to three days. Perfect, good. And it says here, you know, the bridge should be about five days overlapping. That's actually a long time. I, I don't think the bridge ever lasted, but that's what ATI says, I believe. So I go along with the Kool-Aid. I drink that ATI Kool-Aid every day. <laughs> you have to. Yeah. You have to. I mean, if your test is going to be on that, your product. Okay. We've already done SSRIs. Oh, yeah, versus the tricyclics because of that mortality. Oh, my God. It is all in route 80% died of cardiac disruptions. So that's the big deal. So the very quickly, I think in the 90s, the SSRIs really came to popularity because of that. Oh, we're getting into antibiotics. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, where are we? Back here. Metronidazole. What kind of drug is that? Let's see. It's for UTI. It's for a lot of different things, right? The metronidazole? Yes. But uh, what's, the, what's the classification or category? Antibacteria and antiprozole. Yeah, kind of weird. But what is a really popular use in the hospital? <clears throat> yeah, definitely in, in GI. Can you give this prophylactically for uh, pre-surgical guts? That's a big thing. Diverticulitis, anything gut. This flagell is the one. That's the one. And so you give it a pre-surgical guts. Yeah, yeah, prophylactically. Or it's used to treat, uh, to help with Diverticulitis. Yeah, there's our missing crystal. Okay, very, very good. Did you answer a question? I think you did. You said UTI, but let's think that. Okay. Okay. Because the reason I say that, because that's what we see all over the hospital. Okay. Let's do some myosins here. Let's do some antibiotics. What are aminoglycosides or glycosides? What do they end in? Myosins, yes. You have different types of myosins, don't you? So the aminoglycoside category is M-I-C-I-N. But what is the big thing that you need to know about it? Odo and nephrotoxicity. That's right, odo nephrotoxicity. The problem with this, you guys, is that ototoxicity could be permanent. Can you imagine if you had a family member going to the hospital, had a lousy nurse not paying attention to, oh my, I have ringing in my ear. Oh, it's, it's, it'll go away. Penny, it'll go away. No, my ears are actually being damaged right now. So we want to definitely watch that. How do you know that it is nephrotoxic? Nephrotoxic, how do you know that? What are your measurements for nephrotoxicity? No, that it's actually showing signs of nephrotoxicity. 
urine output, EUN, creatinine, right? Thinking like a nurse. And how do I know that that's hurting my kidneys? Oh, the BUN's going up, creatinine's going up, urinary output's going down, TFR's going down. It's like, oh crap. And then you look at your med list, it's like they're on myosin without any previous renal disease, right? That's the thing. So we've got to use critical thinking, think like a nurse, catch this stuff before it really causes permanent damage. Oh, let's see my CI in. We got one minute before our last break. Well, we've already done the dazzle lamp. Oh, I think we're back up to the top. Very good. Oh, NMS. So, who's, who would be next on the list? Back there. So when you come back, could you please teach us about NMS? That would be awesome. Yay.